Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NEH Humanities Connections webinar for prospective applicants. We'll go ahead and get started in just a minute with an overview of the program and application process, which will be followed by time for Q&A. Just to let you know, we'll be grouping questions to answer, sim answer similar ones together or versions of the same question, and we'll do that toward the end. But in general, we'll be answering questions in the order received, and we may not get to all of them, but if we don't, we're very happy to have you follow up with us individually. There are also uh, a series of handouts or files available in the handouts section. This includes our FAQ or Frequently Asked Questions document, uh, the NOFO, Notice of Funding Opportunity, or what we also call the Guidelines document, a copy of this PowerPoint that we're going through today, the research and related budget form that you'll need to use, and the instructions for that budget form as well. Um, so... I'm just taking a look here to make sure that um, you know where things are. Hopefully the con webinar controls make sense to you. And we will be using the uh, chat box for those questions. I won't necessarily be looking at it right now, but um, we'll, we'll be picking it up um, later. And again, we may have too many to get to, but um, we will use that. But also, therefore, please don't use the chat for just chatting or writing yay or hooray or um, you know, we like your approbation, but unfortunately, um, you know, there's enough of a traffic flow that we'll want to just keep it to that being the place where you want to ask your questions. So um, to do a few introductions, um, I'm Rebecca Boggs. I'm the program leader for the Humanities Connections um, grant program. I work as a program officer with the NEH Division of Education Program. Uh, and Nick D. Toronto, our program analyst, is also with us, and we're being helped today on the webinar by program assistant Mariam Moezi. Um, Nick, do you want to show them our introduction picture? And I don't know if you want to turn on your webcam for a moment to let them see who you are. Sure. So there we're are. both actually here. You may, at various points, you may or may not see both our, our little boxes. In fact, after we get past this slide, I will probably turn off my webcam so that I think you'll just get a view that is um, just the slides. Um, but you know, we are both still here and you'll see our smiling faces again at the end. Um, so in fact, I'm pressing the magic button to get rid of my webcam. Um, just to let you know, this presentation will roughly be following the order of our Notice of Funding Opportunity or NOFO document. This is also what people call the program guidelines. So you can uh, follow along on your copy if you want to, or be able to find them when you come back. So um, we can go to the slide that'll show you where you would find that on our program page, because this document is your blueprint for how to build a strong application. We encourage you to become very familiar with it, use it as a roadmap that will help you put your best foot forward for success. And while today's presentation won't cover every detail covered in the NOFO, we will give you a general overview, highlight some of the most important parts, and clarify some points of common confusion. So in order to get your own copy of it, besides taking a copy out of the handout section here where Nick has already made it available to you, um, you can go to the Humanities Connections program page, scroll down to step one under download application materials, and you'll see circled here that the first item there is Humanities Connection Notice of Funding Opportunity. Um, in general, this part of the program page has a lot of great resources for preparing your application, as you'll see throughout our presentation. But right now, this is the one that we want to make sure that you're aware of. So next, I'll give you an overview of some basics about the program. Humanities Connection supports projects that will expand the role of the humanities in undergraduate education at two-year and four-year institutions. Applications for this current cycle will be due at the end of September 2020, and this is for projects that could start as early as June 1st, 2021, and must start no later than September 1st, 2021. Projects at the planning level last for one year with a budget of up to $35,000. Those at the implementation level last for between 18 months and three years with a budget of up to $100,000. Now, we'll dive a little deeper later on about how you might decide which level to apply for, but for now, knowing how much time and funding are available at each level should help you in determining which one would be the best next step to take you from where your institution is now to where you want to be. 
So the purpose of this grant program is for these awards to support innovative curricular approaches, ones that will encourage and develop new integrative learning opportunities for students. The Humanities Connections Awards foster productive partnerships among humanities faculty and their counterparts outside the humanities, in the social sciences, in the natural sciences, and in pre-service or professional programs, such as business, engineering, health sciences, law, computer science, and other technology-driven fields. Now, for a compelling proposal, you'll want to demonstrate within these areas that your proposed curricular project expands the role of the humanities in addressing significant and compelling topics or issues in undergraduate education at your institution and any institutions that might be collaborating with you, if that's relevant, that these projects develop the intellectual skills and habits of mind cultivated by the humanities, and that faculty and students will benefit from meaningful collaboration in teaching and learning across disciplines as a result of the project. You'll find these details about the purpose of the program and more on the first two pages of the NOFO. Be sure to read them carefully to make sure that your proposed project fits well within the aims of this grant program. There are also four core features that all humanities projects must include. Substantive and purposeful integration of the subject matter, perspective, and pedagogical approaches of two or more disciplines with a minimum of one in and one outside of the humanities. Secondly, collaboration between faculty from two or more separate departments or schools. Now here, schools refers to internal divisions like the School of Engineering or School of Education or of Humanities or Arts and Sciences, but these collaborating departments or schools might all be within your own institution, or if you're partnering with other institutions, you might have members of the humanities department say at your community college, collaborating with colleagues in the uh, department or schools of medicine or health sciences at the research university down the road. Either of those is fine. Thirdly, experiential learning must be an par intrinsic part of your curricular plan. And finally, you must have long-term institutional support for your proposed curriculum innovation. Now, you may be wondering, what kinds of projects have we seen in making awards for this program? Well, a very wide range, combining fields across all areas of the humanities with those outside of them. Here are some examples of areas that Humanities Connections grants have focused on, but they're by no means the only possibility. We've had ones with ethics and the professions, uh, fields in medical and health humanities, environmental humanities, at the intersections of science, technology, and society, uh, programs in business or entrepreneurship combined with humanities areas, um, areas that bring together art history combined with materials science, uh, looking at, say, um, ancient paint and glass uh, from the materials science perspective as well as the art history perspective, uh, a focus on veteran studies, and areas in digital humanities. Uh, we can't wait to see what you come up with next. If you'd like to know more about the projects that have been funded in past grant cycles and also to get an inside look at key parts of some successful proposals, you can take a look under that program resources header a little further down under step one after the NOFO and the grants.gov application package. This is where you'll find links to our helpful frequently asked questions document, um, to lists that show all of the projects that were funded over the past few years at each level for planning and for implementation. Um, as a bonus tip, these lists here are actually links that are generated out of our wonderful NEH funded project query form, and that's a tool that you can use at any point to do your own searches. You can see what's been funded at your institution or in your state or on a particular topic of interest to you using keywords or specific phrases. You can search within a particular grant line across all the grant lines in a particular division like education or research or public programs or across the whole NEH. You can search for the past year, for a given decade, or the whole 50 plus years of NEH grant making. So you can find that through our main page or um, also if you Googled NEH funded project query, you would find it. But that's what this is taking you to essentially is a search that says, show me all of the NEH uh, funded projects in Humanities Connection Planning Grants for the last three years, say. Underneath that, where it says sample application narrative, you'll see examples taken from some proposals that were successful and were awarded funding. Uh, this document will include the entire proposal narrative 
as well as key parts of related materials. It usually might include the work plan, sometimes also the readings and resources or information on courses that would be affected by the curricular change, um, but it won't, for example, have the project budget. We provide four examples for each level, so you can see a variety of topics, types of institutions, and approaches. We always say that these are samples, not models, so you don't need to do what they do or do it the way that they did it. But we do hope that these samples help you see how these applicants crafted a persuasive presentation and explanation of their project. Also, seeing a real-life example may help you as you work through how to balance breadth and depth in your proposal being clear and concise in simultaneously getting across the big picture of what you're aiming at and enough concrete specifics to show us how you'll get there. So here's an example of one of our planning grants and it's actually one of the samples that's up on the webpage so you can take a closer look if you're interested. Uh, this is a planning grant from the University of Dayton which is an urban mid-sized Catholic university and in their case they were planning new curriculum using the life and work of Paul Lawrence Dunbar who is a Dayton native and famous African-American writer to examine significant themes in American history and culture. So they were revising courses in computer science, sociology, history, and music and developing new place-based experiential learning opportunities using Dayton's rich collections of Dunbar material objects and artifacts. So this is one example of a project whose content is anchored in some local knowledge and special collections and opportunities, but that links out to much broader curricular threads that the students are engaging with. Um, another sample project that is from a large public land grant institution, Texas A&M, with about 54,000 undergraduates overall, 6,500 in its College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. Um, they were creating a new minor in Hispanic Agricultural Studies, developed jointly by faculty from Hispanic Studies and from Horticultural Sciences. And they were looking to create this four-course interdisciplinary minor focusing on the land, food, peoples, and narratives of Hispanic Texas, and integrating humanities, including Spanish, sociolinguistics, discourse analysis, with the agricultural sciences, soil, crops, animal husbandry, horticulture, nutrition, and in the course of this, highlighting Mexican-American Mexican contributions to the state's demographic vitality and its economic viability, and developing students' linguistic and cultural skills through experiential learning activities. So those two examples, and again, there are two more, uh, 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 three more actually, uh, sample narratives on the project and many more in the list of um, projects funded. You'll see a wide range, you know, large institutions, small institutions, public, private. Um, the implementation sample projects that we'll look at, um, these are actually both up as examples of sample narratives on the website. This one is from a large career-oriented public community college in New York City, the Fashion Institute of Technology, or FIT, and it serves approximately 10,000 students. Um, so in their case, they were creating, through a partnership among their history faculty and art and design faculty, in this project of teaching business and labor history to art and design students, creating this interdisciplinary curriculum, and doing professional development for the art and design faculty that's designed and conducted by the history professors and then jointly developing the curriculum together and then also when they've created the curriculum and begun implementing it at their institution disseminating it through two conferences and also through a resource website that other institutions would be able to make use of another implementation project uh, living with the urban ocean uh, comes to us from University of Massachusetts, Boston, a large public research university um, with many undergraduates from the city and surrounding areas. Um, and they were looking to develop a three course cluster on Boston Harbor and its surrounding areas that would be the core of their new environmental humanities minor. So it was going to be co-taught by faculty in the humanities, English, Native American studies, gender leadership and public policy, and by faculty in the environmental sciences. But importantly, it would be incorporating humanistic methods of inquiry, such as literary analysis, archival research, storytelling, writing and reflection, and interpretive exercises in order to bring this to bear on understanding the environmental humanities. They also have community partners lined up, the National Park Service and the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation, and they would also be disseminating uh, their grant findings and their work through campus workshops for faculty and community 
and through conference presentations at the Association for Environmental Studies and Sciences. So these are just some examples of the kinds of things that people have done. You may be thinking as you're wondering, um, you know, uh, how to proceed, whether you should apply for an implementation grant or a planning grant. And I think it's important to say that you shouldn't be swayed by funding amounts or timelines, thinking the biggest one is the biggest bang for the buck. You want to pick the one where you can be the most successful and make an appropriate case, given the stage of development that you and your colleagues have reached with your curricular plans. Now, you'll get a good sense of each level from the program category section on pages two to three of the NOFO, and you want to read those carefully, as what I'm giving here is just a rough and ready guide to help with your decision making. So. The language there says about the implementation proposals that they must show unambiguous evidence of prior planning and present a defined rationale with clear intellectual and logistical objectives that are supported by institutional commitment. The award gives applicants the opportunity to build on faculty and administrative or institutional partnerships and to develop and refine the project's intellectual content design and scope. For example, the applicant should be able to demonstrate potential commitments of any partners or collaborators, outline preferred approaches to curriculum building or consolidation, and explain outreach strategies that will be employed to attract students to the new educational opportunity. The outcome of an implementation award should be a project that has completed its pilot phase. So if you're thinking of applying for an implementation grant, you should be ready to supply a pretty high level of detail in your proposal when it comes to areas such as the project structure and components, the key topics and specific texts or resources you'd rely in in particular courses, the roles and responsibilities of the individual collaborative team members, including any community partners or collaborators at other institutions. And if you're not there yet, think about applying for a planning grant. You don't have to get a planning grant to receive an implementation grant, but you do have to have gone through a planning stage and be able to articulate what you've learned from that process. When you're thinking about the topics for curricular innovation, we'd like to point out some areas that are currently highlighted agency-wide as being of special interest for NEH, especially a more perfect union, which is our special initiative in advancing civic education and commemorating the nation's 250th anniversary, which is coming up in 2026. So it seeks to support projects that promote a deeper understanding of American history and culture, advance civic education and knowledge of our core principles of government, and examine how our founding ideals are met in a modern pluralistic society. And you'll also see in the NOFO, it says that applications about the contributions of underrepresented communities are highly encouraged. On those pages three and four of the NOFO, you can find more information um, about this special initiative and about two others, Standing Together, which focuses on using the humanities to help Americans understand the experiences of service members and to assist veterans as they return to civilian life, and protecting our cultural heritage, which calls for projects that study, document, or create digital representations of lost or imperiled cultural heritage materials. And it also has a special encouragement to include Native American organizations and communities as lead applicant, applicants and project partners. Projects do not have to fit within or address these NEH areas of interest. Once proposals come in, they're all on equal footing, they're all judged by the same review criteria, but it's worth having a sense that if this is an area that's of interest to you, a um, proposal that addresses one of these initiatives might generate additional attention or interest or get a second look. We also wanna say a few words about the baseline eligibility criteria for submitting an application for Humanities Connections. Applicants must be an accredited US institution of higher education, either public or private with 501c3 status. If you're the project director heading the project, make sure that you're affiliated with and submitting it through an eligible institution of higher education. You cannot apply for this grant as an individual. The institution is the applicant, not you. Foreign and for-profit entities are also ineligible to apply. Collaboration with other post-secondary institutions is welcome, but a single institution must serve as the applicant of record, and they're the one that would be programmatically, legally, and fiscally responsible for the award. And the project director, or at least one of them, if you have more than one, must be currently employed by or affiliated with the applicant institution. So to answer some questions you might have about the number or kind of applications that your institution can submit. Yes, your institution can collaborate with other post-secondary applications uh, institutions on an application with one of them as the applicant of record. 
you'll want to be sure to explain the nature of the collaboration, what the different partners contribute, how the logistics will work, and to have all of the requisite letters of commitment as part of your uh, relevant attachments. Your institution can submit more than one Humanities Connections application at the September deadline if they're for distinctly different projects, whether at the same funding level, different funding levels, as long as they have no over overlapping costs, and as long as the institution is prepared and committed to carrying them out should more than one be funded. Each application would be evaluated on its own merits. NEH might fund both, one, or neither. Your institution cannot apply for the Humanities Connections program with the same project that was submitted for another pending, pending NEH application, such as Humanities Initiatives, or for a project whose activities or costs overlap with another application or approved award for federal funding, whether that's from NEH or another federal agency. But your institution can seek funding from more than one NEH program, such as Humanities Initiatives on the one hand and Humanities Connections on the other, for distinct projects that serve complementary aspects of the same overall goal and do not involve overlapping costs. For example, if your institution is interested in a new focus on medical and health humanities, and it already submitted a Humanities Initiatives proposal focused on professional and curricular development to address ethics and patient care for its undergraduate and graduate programs in nursing. Humanities Initiatives, you can do graduate stuff too. Humanities Connections, undergraduate only. Well, if it did that, it can't double dip and resubmit the undergraduate part of that for a Humanities Connections project with some of the same proposed activities or budgeting for things it already proposed there with regard to the undergraduate nursing curriculum. But it could submit a proposal in a different area of medical and health humanities that the institution wants to focus on and that doesn't overlap in plans and costs. For example, if it wants to create a new certificate focusing on narrative medicine that would be open to students in all of your health professions tracks as well as the humanities and liberal arts majors. So if both got funded, each would be able to do its separate thing, they wouldn't have overlapping costs, and your institution would run two complementary projects that contribute to a larger whole. In any case, if you're considering multiple submissions, whether on related complementary topics or totally separate ones, or if you have any areas where you have questions or concerns about these issues, we strongly encourage you to talk with an NEH program officer. So now that you know what you can and can't apply for, how can you make your application as strong as possible? I'll give you some general tips first, and then we'll dive back into some of the specifics with regard to humanities connections. Preparation is key. First, read the guidelines. It sounds basic, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do that or don't do it carefully enough. The guidelines will help you determine if this program is the right fit for you want to, what you want to do and, as we've said, at what level, planning or implementation. They will also tell you what you need to put into your application. Be sure to look at the sample narratives of other successful applications and other resources like the FAQ on that program resource page. We also can't emphasize this enough. Talk to a program officer. Don't worry that you might be bothering us. Uh, working with applicants is an important part of our job and one that we really enjoy. It's exciting for us to hear about the things you want to do and we want to help you make your application stronger. You can contact us with questions, um, as we'll talk later, for feedback on, on drafts or on other materials. So ask early, ask often um, to get your questions answered if they're not covered in the NOFO, FAQs, et cetera. So, to make a strong proposal, you want to think as all of the parts of the proposal as a unified argument for funding you. The job of the proposal is to make a case. You want to be strategic, be explicit, and be clear. And here, um, we've made a little graphic where I want you to think of the narrative as the first and foremost part to focus on. It's going to be technically uploaded as attachment one, and here I've just listed out also those little separate headings of what are the different parts of your narrative that you'll see outlined in the NOFO. And then there are a set of at least five other attachments, two through six attachments. There are um, attachments seven and eight that might be required in certain cases. You can look at the details. All of those are what you want to think of as important other elements that help bolster your case. And you want to look carefully at the NOFO for exactly what needs to go in each of these. But in one sense, think about the narrative first and then about how those other pieces are going to support it. So in order to make your case, 
we want to start with looking at the review criteria to think carefully about your project's intellectual significance throughout the materials that you submit. Certainly, most importantly, the narrative, but also the other ones. Provide context. We don't know your institution. We don't necessarily know your field. Make sure that we know the things that an outsider would need to know, not just the things that are in your head. Develop a clear and realistic work plan, and you'll want to unpack that for us in your description of the narrative, but then also schematically in the appendix work plan that you upload. And demonstrate to us the likely impact. So again, on the one hand, you're projecting, because if you already knew what to do and had it all set, you wouldn't need this grant. But it needs to be more than just a guess of, well, this might uh, do some good. Give us the reasons that this is really going to have a significant impact. Throughout the proposal, you want to remember your audience. You're not writing for faceless bureaucrats. You're writing for panel reviewers, um, writing for NEH staff and members of the National Council, many of whom will probably not be experts in your subject. It's very common, for example, for a review panel to contain scholars and experts from several disciplines historians, literature scholars, so on. And in humanities connections, you may have scholars outside the humanities who collaborate with or work at the intersection with the humanities. At least one panelist will always be someone who's directed a humanities connections project, someone who can really understand from the inside what it's like to grapple not only with the content, but also with the logistics of making this kind of curricular change happen. You want to make sure that your proposal is clear and accessible to an educated generalist, that's a great idea to get a colleague from outside your field to read your proposal. But you also want to make sure that you're attentive to the things that someone who is a specialist in your field would be expecting to see, that you're not neglecting uh, key areas. If you're um, drawing on text, that they wouldn't say, I don't know why they're using this instead of um, this other thing that's really important or, you know, well, that isn't quite up to date. So think about both those pieces, but about framing them for generalists so that people uh, don't have to rely on inside knowledge. You want to make sure that your proposal addresses those review criteria in a clear and explicit way. You want to avoid any jargon, whether it's field specific or um, catchphrases, really something that can be understood by anyone give us concrete details that help us understand them and make that information easy to find. Be sure that you're using the headers that are given to you for the different sections. And if we haven't said how something has to be formatted, think about making it make the most sense to a reader. If we didn't say your bibliography or list of readings and resources has to be alphabetical, which we don't, you might organize it by topic area or by the readings that pertain to the four different courses that you're trying to revise or create, or the key readings that your um, faculty core group are going to work on together, followed by others that they'll draw on more extensively um, as they dive into their uh, individual courses. Whatever makes sense and make it easy for us to find by scaffolding for us what it is that you're doing. So taking a closer look at those review criteria, in order to do the best job within that Humanities Connections proposal. You wanna keep these at hand throughout your application process. They're on pages 25 and 26 of the guidelines. So that you can keep in mind the ways that the peer reviewers and others at NEH will be asked to think about your proposal and evaluate it. And they're grouped under three main headers, intellectual quality, design quality and feasibility, and impact. And again, in the NOFO, you'll see a series of bullet points um, questions or aspects that are being unpacked with, uh, under each of these. But intellectual quality really stands first and foremost among equals here, because if your project isn't worth doing in terms of intellectual significance, it won't matter how organized you are or how many students those courses might affect. But if you do have a great intellectual focus for your project, you also have to combine that with a feasible design that can get the job done and that will have a significant impact. So they're all important to address fully in your application. Given the current uncertainty stemming from the pandemic, you may want to consider how the potential impacts of COVID-19 figure into your project, as this is something reviewers may be taking into consideration when thinking about criteria of feasibility. But in general, look at what's written in the review criteria. Be sure that an intelligent reader will have strong, positive answers to how well your proposal addresses each of them, 
Ideally, they'll be won over by the time they finish reading your narrative, and then their positive assessment will be strengthened by what they find in the other attachments that follow the narrative. Now, in the NOFO, and in fact, all NEH guidelines from here on out, you'll see the kind of crosswalk that we've screenshotted here from page nine, and it relates the language in the sections of the narrative to the areas of the review criteria that apply. And so you'll be able to, um, with the hyperlinks, hopscotch from one to the other. Um, if you're wondering, oh, let me see, what are those questions under intellectual quality that I can make sure that I've addressed in my intellectual rationale and my content and design section? So to dig a little further into that narrative part, it is the weightiest part of your application because it carries the bulk of the intellectual content of your proposal. But it is limited to 15 double space pages. You want to make sure to carefully address or answer each of the items under each section header. You don't get to be in the room to explain your project. So you want to let the narrative be the main force that does that for you, that really tells the story of who you are as an institution, within your academic programs or areas, what kinds of students you have, how you're trying to serve them, that tells us where things stand now with regards to the humanities at your institution and where you want to be and the future you want to build. And potentially most importantly, how your proposed project would use the time and funding from this grant opportunity to get there. You may have to do some of that only within brief compass in the narrative, using case studies or examples, because you can't give us all the details within those 15 pages, but you want to tell us what we need to know there and then use the other attachments to flesh out that story and give us confidence in your success. So walking through these just briefly, intellectual rationale, why are you doing this, what's the big point? Content and design, how are you going to do it? Collaborative team, who's going to do it? Institutional context and resources, how will those make sure that you can do it? Impact and dissemination, and that's only needed for implementation grants. Okay, what's the upshot? How are you gonna share this with others? And for all of them, evaluation. How will you know if you succeeded? And how are you gonna check along the way to make sure that you can course correct if you need to? So here's a screenshot um, now for pages 18 to 19 of the NOFO that's gonna show you how these different components would need to be included in your ultimate grants.gov submission. You're gonna upload these as PDFs that have the exact file name given here, that's really important, and that observe the page limits indicated. And again, PDF, not Word, not Excel, however they started, they need to end up as PDF. But as you can see here, these blue hyperlinks, they'll take you directly to the instructions for that section of the application. So read carefully there what it is you're being asked to submit in each attachment, and then you should be in great shape. I would say don't overdo it. Remember that human beings are reading these applications. So for relevant research and data, it might be that five well-curated pages summarizing your planning process are more valuable than a 50-page report with all the details, particularly if readers have to wade through the 50 pages to get to the next attachment, which has your project team CVs and relevant letters of commitment, which you do want the readers to see and get information from. So those can all work together to bolster a strong application. Let's talk a little bit about the budget because we are using a new budget form this year, the research and related budget form, which will automatically integrate into your application. So you no longer have to include it as an attachment. Because this is a government-wide form, be sure to read the NOFO guidelines on exactly how to fill it out for the specific grant program's purposes. And that's on pages nine through 18 of the NOFO. Yes, there are a lot of details. Um, and also those are in your handouts, the budget form and the uh, information on how to fill it out. Another new thing to note is that all projects are now required to submit a budget justification that complements the budget form in sense itself. And in fact, it's going to get attached as part of that budget form, not part of those other attachments that we saw earlier. So be sure that you title this file correctly, justification.pdf, and save it as a PDF to ensure that it successfully integrates into the application file that all of the reviewers will see. Again, if you have any questions, you can ask your Office of Sponsored Programs, Research Office, whoever's helping you, um, and, or ask folks at the NEH, our program analysts can often help you untangle any problems. Some general points of budget advice. You do wanna consult those budget guidelines to know in detail what is and isn't allowed. Uh, again, if any of it sounds like it's uh, written in a foreign tongue, talk to your grant administrator who's helping you with um, 
the part of it if you're more the content side. Talk to a program officer if you have questions. You make sure those lines of communication are open between the sponsored research office and uh, the faculty involved. It is worth knowing about some of our funding restrictions, the things that this grant program says you cannot use funding for this. There's a more complete listing on pages 24 to 25 of the NOFO, but I'm going to caution you here against some of the most common pitfalls we see. So in this program, we are not funding the isolated addition or revision of a single course offering. We're thinking bigger than that for curricular innovation and redirection. We're also thinking beyond simply pairing two complementary courses, just setting them next to each other without really collaborating. We're looking for substantive and purposeful interdisciplinary integration, as it says in the review criteria. You cannot use the funding in this program for faculty or student travel abroad, and you can't use it to cover costs for purely social events. Also, never charge alcohol to federal budgets. That's always something that's prohibited. Uh, if you didn't happen to know that, it's worth knowing. So some other things that the NEH cannot fund. It cannot fund the promotion of particular political, religious, or ideological points of view, advocacy for a particular program of social or political action, or support of specific public policies or legislation. So how can you avoid running afoul of uh, these issues? The best antidotes are to be sure that you're including diverse and varied voices, scholars, and sources on any topic especially if there are current social or political hot topics that uh, you're um, dealing with that people may feel um, could be unbalanced one way or another. You want to present participants with unbiased information and allow them to draw their own conclusions based on that information. And if you're handling a modern hot topic issue in the humanities, you want to root it in the longer trajectory of the humanities, say history, um, the trajectory of the field and focus on that larger humanities content in the application, not just the present day concern over it. And avoid buzzwords, language, and goals that are related to advocacy and activism or that might be seen as belonging to one camp or another, especially for hot topic issues. What might be common currency as humanities scholarship or phrases that are constantly used within your field a reviewer, particularly from another field, from a different political perspective, from a different part of the country, might see as advocating for a particular cause or might not understand why it's relevant to the humanities. So by being aware of these differing viewpoints, you can hopefully build a stronger application that participants from any background or perspective would agree is a good fit for this grant program. One last caveat that even in this kind of cross-disciplinary grant program, the NEH cannot fund projects whose main focus falls entirely outside of the humanities. We might see this with projects whose main outcome or central focus is the creation or performance of art, or having their participants produce creative writing, autobiographies, memoirs, creative nonfiction. We might also see this with projects whose outcomes are focused on the non-humanistic or empirical social sciences, such as those dealing with social science research or policy studies as the outcome. We want to have collaboration across boundaries to have this curricular innovation, but if the outcome isn't mainly curricular, and if these other sorts of areas or outcomes are your project's main thrust, you might want to be looking to the NEA or the NSF or nonprofits that support this kind of work rather than to the NEH. So once you know what to do, here's a timeline for when to do it. We are accepting optional draft proposals or materials for feedback until August 31st. This is approximately one month ahead of the submission deadline. If you have a full draft of the narrative, we're happy to review that. You can send drafts of other attachments besides the narrative that seem most relevant, like the work plan or readings. We may look at those alongside the narrative if time permits. The narrative is the key piece. But it's also fine if you don't have a full draft of the narrative ready by that date and you'd still like to get feedback from a program officer to help you strengthen your application. You can send us a project summary and a work plan draft. You can send us a partial narrative draft that lets us know the direction you're intending to head. Whatever it is you want us to see at that point, we're ready to meet you where you are and respond within a time frame that allows you to incorporate that feedback. The final applications will be due in the grants.gov system at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on September 30th. Don't wait until the last minute because of technical issues and you want to account for processing time for validating within the grants.gov system. So the very first thing you should do after this webinar is ensure that you have three important things, active DUNS and SAM numbers, 
and current registrations and passwords for grants.gov because NEH will not grant deadline extensions for delayed registration. Registration in those systems can take up to a month to complete, so check on this straight away, especially if you're a first-time applicant, the institution has never applied, or if your institution hasn't apl applied for federal funding in a long time, it might not be up to date. Remember, for applying as an institution, you'll need to make sure that whoever is applying and pushing the right buttons has the proper roles and authorities assigned to them in grants.gov to access and apply through the institution's application workspace. Your institutional grant administrator or other grant management or sponsored program staff at your institution are great contacts for guidance if you're not sure where to find this information, who to contact for access, whether you or the, they would be putting in the application. If they can't help you, you can contact the Federal Service Desk or grants.gov directly using the contact information on page 27 of the NOFO. And as you'll see pictured here, when you're in grants.gov, be sure that you're selecting the correct package for the level you want to apply for so that the application gets evaluated appropriately. That is, pick the AKA prefix for planning and the AKB prefix for implementation. Picking the wrong one can be a very common error, so just be sure you double check with your grant administrator that you've got the correct package. So, do this ASAP. Here's what you're gonna see on the very first page of the guidelines. This is a screenshot of what appears right under the application due date. This text in red, take it seriously, get on that if, it's, if you're not sure that it's all up to date. So, let me walk you through the review process and the timeline for what happens after you submit that proposal. And this is a careful multi-step process. At NEH, we make our grants based on a peer review process. The first and foundational step is the peer review panel. Once the deadline has passed, we bring together those groups of scholars, humanities professionals, and other experts to read and assess the proposal. For us, that will happen in November and December 2020. They provide ratings and comments for each proposal, and the NEH staff then use that to come up with a set of funding recommendations. The NEH staff will be sending those recommendations forward early in the new year, January to February 2021. Then, those recommendations are presented to the National Council on the Humanities, a group of 26 people nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate, who meet several times a year to advise us on grant making and policy. The recommendations of the staff and the Council are all presented to the Chairman, who by law makes all funding decisions. So the Humanities Connections applications will be considered at the March 2021 Council, after which the Chairman will make the decision, with applications being notified in April 2021 as to whether they were successful. Funded projects may then start as early as June 2021, and all of them must start by September 1st, 2021. Regardless of the outcome, you can get the most out of your relationship with the NEH by following a couple of steps. If you're not funded, you can request your review panel comments. You can contact us for additional feedback or guidance, as well as talking with your peers or with your institution staff about how you might revise and resubmit. You can serve as an NEH panelist. Feel free to reach out to us to let us know you're interested in serving for particular grant programs or in general. And you can apply again for this and other grant opportunities. So with that, here's our contact information, which is also listed on the program or NEH website and in the NOFO. Given that everyone is still working from outside the office at this point, email is the best and quickest way to reach us. Um, we will now open up the floor to the Q&A session. You can write questions in using the chat function of the GoToWebinar window. We'll do our best to um, have them read out, answer the questions for the group. And if you have specific individual questions or if you're watching this webinar afterwards as a recording, please feel free to email your questions to us and we'll respond ASAP. Um, I would recommend if you're doing that, maybe send them to that humanities connections at neh.gov mailbox, and they'll either answer them directly or send them on to um, a program officer um, to be answered. So um, we'll take a look at what's going on in the chat box. I am turning my webcam back on, and I'm going to rely on Nick to let us know what questions that we want to take. Hmm. Hi there. So it looks like the first question I see is actually an issue with the budget form. Um, 
I will get back to you on that, but you can find um, the budget form on grants.gov too. Um, so the next question down um, concerns resumes. Someone was asking if uh, it was two pages total uh, or two pages per person. Two pages per person. And you can make, again, when I said about formatting, make that whatever you think would be best. It could be their short bio from the faculty page. It could be um, a shortened version of their existing CV. But you want to think about um, tailoring it not to um, what you would put in if you're trying to impress someone for publishing a monograph, but for what's needed here. So it might focus less on their publications or only list a few of their publications and more on the courses that they're teaching or the community contacts that they have. So think, what do I need for my readers to know about this particular person and their role in the project in order to give the best content during those two pages per person? Thanks, Rebecca. The next question concerns experiential learning. Um, someone is asking if experiential learning has to be part of every course or if it can be distributed across two courses. Great question. We say it needs to be intrinsic part of the project as a whole. That doesn't mean it has to be incorporated into every element or incorporated in the same way in every element, so that's fine. Um, that may look different for different pieces. And again, you may see some different examples of that when you look at the samples that may give you some ideas. Um, but, I, but you do want it to be a through line and an important part of the project as a whole, not just something that looks like window dressing. Great. Um, and so the next question is, what kind of evidence for long-term institutional support uh, can an applicant present? Great. Um, a lot of times, well, so there are, I'd say, two aspects to the letter of commitment. One is the presence of the letters of commitment in the way that they're asked for in the notice of funding opportunity. So when the notice of funding opportunity says, that you have to have a certain kind or number of letters of commitment from specific kinds of people, you want to make sure that you're um, following that. So if it says this needs to be from leadership, it needs to be from um, a president, provost, or dean, don't just have one from a random faculty member or from your department chair. Or, you know, if you think it's important to have one from the department chair as an element of leadership, but that's um, supplementing, not uh, taking the place of um, a um, higher up person. So I'm looking at page 22 of the NOFO, where it's saying um, to include two letters from the president, provost, and or dean of the applicant institution, attesting that the institution will offer long-term support for the project, explaining its significance within the institution's curriculum. So, um, you also, in some cases, may end up talking about elements of long-term commitment um, that are relevant within the narrative. It might be that something you're doing is part of a larger initiative that's been happening on your campus or something that, um, you know, it, it contributes to a revamp of the general education curriculum that your institution is involved in and the provost is committed to. So you may want to tell us some about it and then also have it come out in the letter of commitment. But um, if you don't have the letters of commitment at all, or if they're not from people of sort of the right stature to affirm that yes, we're behind this, that would be a problem. Great. The next question asked, must a humanities professor lead the team or serve as project director? Great question. We don't put any specific restrictions on who can be the project director other than that it should be someone employed by or affiliated with the applicant institution. So it doesn't have to be a humanities person. In some cases, you'll have someone, you'll have multiple project directors and one is in the humanities and one is outside the humanities. But when there's a single project director, that person might be from the humanities side or the non-humanities side. That's fine. Uh, another question that we sometimes get is about does it matter whether the courses, the curriculum that we're revising are contributing to courses that are listed in the humanities or majors in the humanities or ones that are in non-humanities? What's important is the content and the way these things are coming together. It doesn't matter to us whether the course or courses are in one area, in another area, or cross-listed. Our next question is asking, um, 
are there any specific or major changes to the guidelines or NOFO uh, since last year? Uh, the main difference is that instead of having two separate guidelines documents, there is now one combined guidelines document, um, which means that in harmonizing them, the order and naming of some of those sections has changed. If you applied for an implementation grant last year and you're looking to revise it, it's going to look somewhat similar to that, but a few changes. If you're looking, if you were had applied for a planning grant, and you're looking to revise it, it will have changed a little more. Um, that is, some things that previously were being discussed as part of the planning committee or planning process are now um, under the content and design or under a collaborative team. So things just have different names, but the substance you're being asked for is not really different from previous years. Similarly, some of the attachments now, things that would have been part of one single attachment are now part of two or three different attachments. So um, whatever you had prepared up up to this point using last year's guidelines, you'll be able to use all those pieces. Just make sure that you may need to move some of them around or change some of the language of the headers. And we okay. also integrated the review criteria. So the phrasing of the review criteria may have changed a little bit, but their general impetus has not. Okay, the next question is asking if the recording of the webinar will be available online. Um, I'll go ahead and just say, Yes, you can access um, a recording of the webinar after this concludes by following the registration link to the webinar. Um, it, it should take you to a website and you'll be able to do the recording. Um, it will also be published on NEH's YouTube channel, um, but that might not happen until tomorrow. It kind of depends on when we finish up and when um, our comms team can help us get that published. Uh, so uh, moving on to the next question. Do projects need to be rooted in a single institution or could a project, for example, create an online resource like a website that is hosted by one or more institutions and seek to inform curricula more broadly, e.g. accessible to anyone teaching undergraduates? That's a great question. I think so a project could be in a sense equally shared out among various institutions although one of them will still have to be the institution of record and be responsible for all of the grant management and getting everything in at the same time you want to make sure that what you are doing actually has to do with curricular innovation and either planning or implementing that and not just materials development so developing a set of resources and planning for how those will get used in specific courses across different institutions by specific faculty at least as the lead in even if those might then go on to influence others is i think different from and would be appropriate for humanities connections um, in a way that would not apply for we're creating just a bunch of stuff on a website that could do all kinds of good but we haven't done any of the work that will tie it to specific people making that happen at these different institutions even if different institutions were involved in making it but then you say well how is this what's the impact on your specific institution how is this going to get used in your classroom so um, absolutely materials development as a part of that and it's something that other places can share in and that your whole group can share in as a consortium is great just make sure you're not letting the materials um, cart get put before the collaborative and curricular horse great uh, our next question is asking if a nonprofit affiliate of a college can apply um, the example given is uh, a university social and behavioral sciences in partnership with another institution of higher education and a regional uh, humanities based nonprofit um, So it looks like two, this might two, be a little yeah. bit, yeah. Um, in general, you need for the insti an institution of higher learning that meets those eligibility criteria that we discussed to be the applicant of record. Another kind of nonprofit might be a kind of partner or community partner, but since this is a curricular innovation grant, if nonprofits don't do curriculum and don't have students and don't serve those particular undergraduate populations in the same way, it's not really appropriate for them to be
be the applicant as opposed to doing various things to help you shape it and to play a role in doing that. So if there seems to be a wrinkle on this that um, isn't resonating with you, feel free to contact us um, or talk to your sponsored research programs. But in general, the applicant is going to be a university, a consortium, the research arm of your um, state systems uh, institutions, whatever it is, not the nonprofit because it wouldn't meet those eligibility criteria um, discussed earlier on. And, and so a similar question um, is whether or not there's a limit to the number of partners that you know an institution might be collaborating with and whether or not those um, different partners um, have to be within the same educational institution. Um, I think you answered some of that already, but I'll allow you to add yeah, anything else. Yeah, just to kind of make it clear, you could mm -hmm. have all kinds of partners. They, you know, as long as one institution is the institution of record, not all of those partners have to be within the same institution. At the same time, I think you want to spell out how the different partnerships work and which ones are most core. Because again, kind of like the 50 page appendix, you don't want to have 70 different partners where no one has a sense of which ones are really important or these are all potential partners. Um, but in some cases, people do have working relationships already with a whole array of, say, um, institutions or nonprofits or local um, businesses for student internships. And you're able to say in an appendix, you know, this is something we're already working with. Here's how we're building on that or incorporating it into curriculum or taking it to the next level with student reflection on their internship experiences. But you may still want to say, you know, these are some that are key or that, that have the largest number of students or here are some different types of institutions that people intern with rather than having just kind of an amorphous sea of too many partners for anyone to really grasp. Okay, uh, the next question is asking, if you receive a planning grant, can one come back later and apply for an implementation grant? Uh, short answer is yes, absolutely. but I'll let Rebecca to, yeah, add a little bit yeah, there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Must the proposal be anchored in one central project, but then link out to broad, broader curricular threads, or can it be more broadly focused on setting up a set of collaborations around different issues between humanities and STEM fields on a campus? Great question. I think in a sense, the answer for that is a little bit different depending on whether you're at a planning or an implementation level. But I think in both cases, what you want is to serve your aims without losing focus. So you may have to think about looking at those review criteria. <coughs> Excuse me. Am I better off trying to tackle several areas at once? Um, and link them as part of a new way of thinking about the interaction between these humanities and non-humanities areas, like a bunch of humanities and a bunch of STEM? Or do I want to focus down on one particular set of areas or intersections? Um, and we've seen both of these be successful. If you take a look in the funded projects, you'll have ones where people were working on planning um, new certificates or minors in business and humanities and in medical humanities. Um, at the same time, because they're just taking a new approach and they're trying to lay the groundwork for doing this. In other cases, you might see ones that are just in business humanities or just in medical humanities or just in environmental humanities. So on the one hand, when you take a bunch of broader areas, you might have broader impact, but you don't want to also end up being a mile wide and an inch deep. So this is a good place to kind of take stock of your institutional priorities, think about what you think you can do well and what you want to do during that time, and talk to an NH program office and they may be able to give you a read on, I think you might be more successful doing X or Y. But pick one, try it, see how it goes. And our next question again is sort of asking about uh, projects where um, there might be collaborators from you know more than one institution um, and to reiterate, yes, that is allowed. Um, and if you do have collaborators from an outside institution, uh, it is definitely beneficial to have a letter of commitment from them if they'll be doing substantive work uh, with their planning team. Um, the next question is whether or not an institution can apply for a planning and an implementation grant for different phases or aspects of the same project. 
that's a good question. And in general, here's the sticking point. What are you ready to do? So it would be difficult to say at the same time both, we don't know where we want to go yet with our medical humanities work. So we need a planning grant in order to get the right people in the room and ask the right questions and lay the groundwork. And at the same time in the other program, we're ready to implement our medical humanities curriculum because we've already done planning. So um, if, they're the, if they're different phases of the same work, I think you have to assess really where you are and pick the one that works. If you are at different points with different parts of, you know, with environmental humanities, we're at implementation, but we'd like to get in on a planning stage of doing the same kind of work in um, ethics and nursing. You could put both of those in. They don't overlap, and it makes sense that you're in a different place with both of them, where you might be saying institutionally, we're at a stage of exploring these kinds of connections, but we're in a different place with one than with the other. Um, but really, again, if you have questions, and especially if you are thinking of putting in multiple applications, talking to a program officer is a good idea. Because you, you want to not spread yourself so thin that you're going off in all these different directions. But if you do have multiple ideas that are ready to go, you don't need to keep one of them on the back burner um, if they really are separate. Our next two questions, again, have to do kind of with letters of commitment, um, asking how many letters of commitment do you recommend, including um, and also um, must major participants in the grant proposal be tenure or uh, tenure track faculty. Um, I think Rebecca answered sort of that that first part of the question is you want letters of commitment from all the major people involved in the grant. Um, the major participants don't have to be tenure or tenure track faculty per se. Um, but I'll right, Rebecca exactly. Think, so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So you need letters letters from leadership that say they're committed to the project, but then you need letters from individual participants, your core team, that say what they're going to do. And what's important about those people is not how fancy their title is or, or their background, but that they're the right people to get that work done in terms of what they know, in terms of their role at the institution. So many of these projects, you may decide that it's important to hear stakeholder voices from graduate students or undergraduate students in focus groups or you know, a large proportion of your teaching is done by adjuncts, and there are adjuncts who have been at your institution for 15 years, and they're key parts of your core faculty team. That's not a problem. Um, what is important is just telling us what, you know, what needs to happen in your project for this to work. Mm -hmm. The next question is asking um, about the software needed. Um, the main software you really need to make sure you have is something, um, some sort of PDF uh, creation software. So Adobe is the first one that comes to mind. All your application components need to be submitted uh, as PDF. Um, otherwise, our system won't be able to read it um, and it will create some technical issues. Uh, moving on. Okay, so for non-humanities departments, would a social science discipline be acceptable or does it need to be STEM? Uh, that's a great question. I think the question is, whether what you're doing is a collaboration but you know between the humanities and outside the humanities and what matters for the is how the neh looks at the humanities not whether your institution says um history is a social science so our department of humanities covers you know english and philosophy but not history um for the purposes of the neh humanistic social science is part of the humanities but quantitative social science isn't or if someone's doing social science work that spans both of those areas so a lot of it is sort of it depends but it's definitely not the case that the only non-humanities that counts is stem it can be quantitative social science it can be pre-professional track so when in doubt um, talk with us or send us your draft materials where you've tried to articulate the ways in which you know it's important for us that um, this set of public policy work, which is research oriented, really is the non-humanities piece that we're bringing together with anthropology or philosophy or literature or whatever it is, and see whether that makes sense to the person reading it. Um, you know, you can, can get feedback from us or, or from your peers, but for a lot of it, you can probably ask, is this social science already part of the humanities? Could person doing this work apply to the NEH for a fellowship 
uh, for the kind of work they do? And if the answer is yes, then they're really not going to be the non-humanities part of that collaboration. Okay, our next question is, can funding be used to support a course release for a faculty or team member who is developing one of the cluster courses? Great question. A lot of that kind of look to the budget specifics, but in general, whatever your institution says is permissible and fits with the NEH guidelines can work. That can be paying them outright. It can be paying for a course release. What you can't do is I'm going to release this person from his or her course and I want to pay the replacement teacher and I'm going to fund that replacement teacher um, out of the NEH budget. Don't do that. Do pay for the person's course release or their, um, you know, overload or whatever it is. But that's a question for your institutional mm -hmm. grant and bin about how do we do that at our particular institution. NEH is fine by NEH rules. If this is a planning grant specific question coming up next. Mm -hmm. um, they're asking whether um, we recommend smaller focused interdisciplinary collaborations, similar to some of the examples um, that we provided in the PowerPoint and also on the website. Um, so, for example, incorporating history and ethics into engineering, or could they propose um, a university wide core curriculum to change the humanities? breadth of knowledge, general education, to specific requirements in history of racial formations and social justice. So basically asking, can you, you know, do a, uh, a general education core curriculum type project um, more broadly with a planning grant? Good question. Yeah, I think that gen ed reform or revamp can often be part of what we're looking at. I think it comes back to a version of the question that was asked earlier, sort of about how broad is too broad? And um, as well as in this case, when you mentioned social justice initiatives, you also want to kind of watch the flag of what part is academic and what part might look as though you might be in danger of running afoul of the NEH uh, guidelines about not funding um, advocacy or politi particular political programs, particular programs of social action. Um, so again, this is probably a good one to talk to a program officer, but in some cases you might be better off focusing on the creation of a pathway or a series of pathways within general education um, rather than, you know, all of general education forever. Because again, the question of also, what can I use my funding and time for? What's a reasonable chunk to bite off? And defining that as your project. Because also, again, you want to say, what am I using this NEH funding for? And, in some, and, and can it be successful? Because if it's only a really small bite of a really big piece, you know, then you say, well, where's the rest, where's the impetus for the rest of it coming from? And it may be if you say, this is already happening at my institution or my institution is doing X amount of um, in-kind support or of cost sharing, then that's one thing. But otherwise, it may make more conceptual sense to define your project as the, the piece of it that you're asking for the NEH support for. Great. Uh, the next question, similar. Um, Regarding the requirement of having two different um, schools or colleges or other academic units um, collaborate, um, if the two departments are within the same college, for example, in a college of engineering, would that satisfy the collaboration requirement? It depends on whether you're, if you have one within and one outside of the humanities, then potentially, yes. Yeah. So um, the departments could be within a single school or could be in separate schools as long as you're also meeting those other criteria. Again, and if you have a question, talk to a program officer. We can help you think through it. Kind of a general question um, about funding. Um, if we could provide some examples of the sorts of things, project budgets, particularly winning project budgets, um, usually request support for. Um, I think that probably your best guidance here is just looking at the NOFO about the kinds of activities that are undertaken at different levels, you know, faculty planning, implementation, whatever, and then thinking about, well, what do I need to support that? Is it buying faculty time? Are there certain materials or resources we need to acquire? I don't think there, there isn't really a one size fits all, which is why we don't provide specific guidance on those points. So I think that might be a good one, again, to talk to a program officer if you're feeling uncertain once you've talked about the content of it, of saying, you know, does this or that work or not work for the budgeting? But a lot of that, um, the budgeting is really sort of secondary to or subordinated to the question of what do you want to do? And then what do you need to pay for to make that happen? But a lot of time it will be stuff like 
faculty time um, if those faculty aren't already being compensated by the institution for, you know, the course development or for taking the time to come together with their colleagues or whatever it is. Or that's often a large part of it. It's by no means the only part of it. Okay, the next question is about advocacy. Um, so a particular question, um, if a course advocates for diplomacy over military in, uh, intervention, does that violate the guidelines? Oh, it, I mean, that sounds like it could be supporting a, a you know, supporting a particular policy. I, I don't know. I mean, again, I think that's probably one where it's good to talk to a program officer about does this sound as though it violates the guidelines? And if so, is there a different way of approaching this or of couching this that gets at the same intellectual questions but doesn't sound as though um, it's running into that particular problem? Because again, I think it goes back to for some things, you know, um, providing the materials with which your participants could create um, information that students can use to make their own decisions about the pros and cons of different outcomes um, or policies, as opposed to, um, you know, laying out, this is my conclusion, which would be appropriate, you know, in a monograph or in um, an op-ed, but not in this grant program. Yeah, I just add in general, if you have a question about whether or not your your proposal violates um, the advocacy prohibitions, just send an email to Humanities Connections and provide some of the context um, or, you know, submit a draft. And that's probably the best way to get the particular feedback on your question. Um, Absolutely. And so, you know, sort of building on that, um, you know, if someone submits a draft proposal by August 31st, when might they expect to receive feedback and would the feedback be written or oral? Great. Um, in general, we want to get that feedback back to you in enough time for you to make use of it. So I would say a good rule of thumb is that we would try to respond to all of those within the two weeks after they're received. Um, and the nature of that feedback might be dependent on um, what works for that particular program officer or for you. Um, so there's not a set format. Mm -hmm. uh, another question about um, what sort of evidence would an applicant need to provide to indicate long-term institutional support? Yeah, I think we've covered that. Mm -hmm. So if you have questions, get in touch with us. Yep. Uh, next question. What's the makeup of the review panel? And can applicants expect uh, an even split between humanities and science or technology scholars? Um, sort of what's the general makeup in terms of the number of educators on a review panel? These review panels are usually four, sometimes five um, panelists when we convene things in Division of Education programs. Um, there's not a set split, but in general, the idea would be, as I said, we always have at least one person who has been a project director in the Humanities Connections program. And otherwise, we bring together people who are appropriate for covering the range of topics that are brought together on that particular panel, which is going to vary based on what comes in. I think this next question might be um, with regard to an implementation application, but they're asking how much information from a planning grant would you recommend submitting in the narrative and in appendix materials? What you need to get the job done. <laughs> Again, talk to a program officer if you have questions, but um, yeah, you want to hit the, you know, enough to, for people to understand in the narrative, what did you do in the planning grant? How did it go? What did you learn from it? How is it preparing you to do the implementation in a good way? And in the appendix, what do they need to know to have that background? Um, but depending on what you've got sitting around, I have a nice 10 page summary. Maybe you put that in. If it's 100 pages, maybe not. The next question is asking whether or not projects developed around a particular theme of local issues or knowledge have a better chance of getting funded? Uh, there is no better, but I think the things that are most likely to get funded are the ones that are people are really um, passionate about and have capitalized on something that is really special. Um, and in some cases, that kind of local knowledge can be one of those areas. It doesn't mean it's the only way. It could be some other, you know, area of new intellectual, uh, you know, groundbreaking stuff, but even often when it's not, it's not the, say, um, the C 
field, it's not taking on a new area totally within the whole field. You're making a new connection between things that are really important to your students and faculty on that local level. So um, they have a good chance if you meet all the review criteria and do the things that, that speak to that significance and impact. Great. The next few questions I think you've touched on already, but the next one um, is, are there any special considerations for minority serving institutions? Great question. Um, so not within this grant program as institutions. We do have humanities initiatives, um, which has particular grant lines for some particular minority serving institutions, the Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, and tribal colleges and universities. But um, all minority serving institutions are very welcome to apply in humanities connections. And part of your mission as minority serving institutions may well be relevant to the way you talk about um, the place of the humanities at your institution, the new directions that you may want to take, because often at at least some minority serving institutions, one of the things they're wanting to do with the humanities is that the curriculum has not necessarily reflected or um, dug into the history or culture of some of the students uh, Demo, the students that are most widely demographically represented, the curriculum is in some way, you know, either ossified or reflecting norms that have been taken from other institutions and really missing an opportunity to dig into these humanities areas or to bridge humanities and non-humanities areas um, in that way. Um, so I think the answer is there's nothing that sets them aside institutionally, but there's a lot that you can do in bringing out the ways that you're meeting those review criteria that speak to what your institution's um, mission and the people it's serving is. And that uh, also might speak to that more perfect union of dealing with histories of unrepresented, com unrepresented communities, potentially, if that's a content area. Although again, in none of our grants do minority serving institutions need to submit applications that necessarily um, deal with content that is related to their demographics or their historical mission. Okay, our next question is asking whether or not the requirements for um, the collaboration between humanities and non-humanities uh, people uh, applies to both the curricular projects, uh, the curricular aspects of the project, and uh, partnerships, which I, I think they mean external partners. I'm not sure I entirely understand um, what's being asked there. I think they're asking if the partners have to be from at least one from a humanities discipline and one from a non-humanities discipline. Um, I'm not entirely certain either, but that was my understanding. Yeah, I mean, so talk to a program officer or take yeah. a look. And also, we have been going for quite a while, so we're not necessarily mm -hmm. going to tackle all of the questions that are there. Um, I also do want to let folks know that um, as a last slide in the set, there is a slide that shows um, how to contact uh, the general mailboxes for all of our different NEH divisions so that if you ever want to volunteer to be a panelist or to ask questions about different um, areas within NEH that you know how to find those, you can always find them within people's individual um, grant program or uh, divisional pages, but this way you also kind of have them in a, in a nice um, little format. So, um, Nick, I don't you want to screen share and throw that up there um, along with my, my talking head. Um, but if you can just give a quick look to the questions there, Nick, and see if you think there are any that um, that are really sort of a um, a burning a burning question that that we should answer before we sign off. Um, we may want to you know draw the the webinar part to a, a close after a mm -hmm. few more. Um, a few more questions. So yeah, do you want to advance that to that last slide that just has the, um, so humanities yeah. connections, this is who to ask for our specific stuff. This one is is um, the, the general one of, um, you know, if you're looking to ask people, you know, education programs first and foremost, but if you've been wondering about what goes on in those other areas. Um, sure, so here's a kind of, um... I think an interesting question that's worth thinking about. Um, is it better to be aspirational and think big 
like you're going to create a new major, but would it be better to be try to be more realistic and modest in their requests? Mm, I think the answer again is what can you do successfully? And in some cases, in a planning grant, maybe you want to do a combination of the two. Maybe you're um, you have a focus, but then you also want to have conversations that are about the bigger picture. Um, but again, I don't think that's a question that can be answered in a vacuum. Um, again, I feel like look at the review criteria, and that may help give you a sense of which one of these is right size. And if not, talk to a program officer. We'll be happy to give you our read. Okay, can you use a platform like Cayuse? I'm not familiar with the platform, sorry if I'm saying that wrong, to submit your application instead of grants.gov? The answer is no, you have to submit your application through grants.gov. Um, there are no other options um, to submit. Um, I've never submitted anything to NEH, but I am positive my institution has. Do I need to register individually or is that in information institutional? I think, Nick, you probably have the answer to this. Sure. The, I, the basic answer is, uh, I think, you know, your institution is going to need to answer about the DUNS and the SAM and whatever. Um, depending on whether they want you to do something within, within grants.gov, you may or may not need to register to do something, but that's a conversation to have with your internal sponsored programs people. Yeah, you won't be registering yourself for SAM and DUNS. Um, it's for organizations. So, I'm, if, you're, if you think your institution probably has uh, a DUNS and a SAMS and likely a grants.gov registration, talk to someone in the sponsored research office. There's someone who has a role um, who can either grant you the role to submit an application or they can submit on, on your behalf and just be uploading their materials. Um, next question, are the letters of support part of the 15 pages? Um, no, the 15 no. pages refer only to the narrative. Um, mm -hmm. Are there restrictions on indirect costs? I'm not entirely sure what that means, but for the budget questions we look, haven't gotten to. Yeah, like look, look at the budget, talk to your office of sponsored yeah. program folks. It, it's, it's likely an institutional thing you need to check with as long as you're complying with, you know, the, the guidelines we laid out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, people asking questions about whether or not this grant will be offered again next year. That's our intention. Um, yeah, I mean, every every year is its own thing. So um, at the same time, if you're thinking about applying and you're not sure, um, should we go ahead and put something in and get feedback or should we keep our powder dry? Talk to a program officer because again, um, you know, there's no point in putting something in if you're too early and you're asking for a grant like we need we're, we need we need to plan to plan. But at the same time, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You may in some cases say, um, no, we, you know, we've got some key people. We're going to talk. I mean, it says in the guidelines, you know, ha tell us about how you'll recruit additional core team members if you need them. It may be that in some cases you say, we're 80% there. Let's, let's get something into the NEH and see where we stand. And if we don't get funded, we can always try again. And that way we'll have gotten some feedback. But talking to a program officer will help you know where to stay in that. And I think this is another good question um, for smaller institutions where departments may include several disciplines. Would collaboration across disciplines be sufficient instead of collaboration across departments? So maybe this is an example for like a smaller liberal arts college or something like that? Yeah, this is, and this is good to talk to a program officer because in general, part of the idea is if you're already within the same department and that department has any kind of real intellectual heft to its existence as opposed to just a purely administrative thing where even within it there are totally siloed pieces, the grant is meant to help you get outside of barriers that are hindering you. And if you're already in the same department, the assumption may be, well, you already know how to do some of that. Um, or if this isn't a good fit for a Humanities Connections grant, maybe it really should be a Humanities Initiatives grant where the humanities plus non-humanities aspect isn't, um, you know, isn't a salient consideration. So again, I would say talk to a program officer, but there's a reason we do tend to phrase it as across departments or schools, not to say that there aren't cases where you might be able to make a case, but in a lot of cases that may signal that you're not really in the right spot um, with, the, with the project. And I think the last question that we haven't really addressed yet, um, there, um, and I think this is answered in the NOFO, I don't have the page number, but is it possible to apply mm -hmm. for an NEH fellowship as an individual and an NEH Humanities Connections planning grant, as long as the dates do not overlap. 
I mean, I would think the the short answer might be yes, as long as you can fulfill, if you can fulfill your obligations to these different things and possibly, but you might want to look into the specifics um, and talk to your institution. But again, since you don't know what, you know, what might work, if the timelines don't overlap, then it probably is fine. Um, so. Oh, and sorry. And also, just question. to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to add one other question after you finish that thought. No, I think that's pretty much, yeah. There you go. Um, someone had a question about um, who comprises the National Council. Ah, you can look on the website and see who is on the National mm -hmm. Council. So it's a variety of individuals across the humanities, different areas, different backgrounds. So um, that changes over time as different people fulfill their terms and get um, proposed or appointed. So find it on our website. Learn about them. I and think, I think, um, go ahead, yeah. I think that's just about everything. Great, and again, just to say, um, we hope that this helps you know how this particular grant program can try to support work that you might be interested in doing. Um, at the same time, if you have work you're interested in doing that doesn't seem to fit with this grant program, we're very happy to talk with you about what grant lines within our division or in other divisions or possibly even, you know, this sounds like something I've seen funded, you know, by this other, you know, nonprofit or federal agency to help you try to find the right place to try to carry things forward. So this is one small but we hope important part of carrying forward the NEH mission, but we are as NEH staff also here in general to further the humanities and the intersections of the humanities with all aspects of um, American life, national life, human life, uh, intellectual pursuit to help you think about how you might best be able to do those. So do be in touch with us um, if we can be helpful with that. And thank you for being here today.